so much and uh, thank you for the wonderful presence of God here today and thank you so much for the invitation uh, this morning that I can be here I'm just so glad that I can be back here after so many situations that happened in Singapore <clears throat> and caused us not to be able to meet uh, on site but how many of you are glad that today we are able to meet here and uh, we just keep on praying and believing that things will get better and things will continue to progress. And how many of you are so grateful that you are still in Singapore who can say amen? How many of you are grateful that you have a wise government <laughs> who is able to handle this pandemic pretty good? And, uh, and we just want to be grateful and be thankful in whatever situation that we are in. Thank you, Pastor Stephen, for having me here this morning again. And uh, before we begin, I want to encourage you today using the Word of God and uh, what our brothers here have said. You know, hope in God, it is so powerful. So let's begin to pray and uh, commit this time to Jesus. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made and we'll be glad and rejoice in it. And Lord, we know that you have great things in store for this church. But Lord, during this season, Lord, of the pandemic, when we are so uncertain and unsure concerning our future, Lord, we want to put our faith and hope in you because you are our anchor of hope. And Lord, with you leading us to the future, it will always be a bright future for everyone. So Father, we thank you. And Lord, we lift up our spirit today. Anoint the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a big round of applause this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now church, uh, as we continue to pray, you know, for Singapore and for this pandemic season to be over, and uh, we are praying that Singapore government, right, is actually bringing, you know, the nation, right, into a situation of endemic where we are able to actually uh, regard this uh, pandemic as a normal thing. And uh, we just hope that God's wisdom and uh, God's anointing and God's protection and grace will be upon our government and upon the nation. However, we must acknowledge that it has not been easy for us the past few months and especially the last one and a half years. Even this week alone, when we are so hopeful, you know, to get back again, to meet in groups of five, suddenly, right, somebody sabo us big time. Hallelujah, right? And uh, when we are all sabo, okay, right, we, are, we need to go back again to meet in groups of two. And uh, we just need to continue to hope and pray that things will not get worse uh, than before. So, the past heightened measures, right, seems to hit us this year harder than last year even in ministry, in a church, and also in a business. Both economically and spiritually, we were actually on a nice rebound last year. Remember? We were on our way out, and we were celebrating 250, going to 500, and then suddenly things took a, a turn, and we experienced a setback. And this has caused a lot of uncertainties and anxiety towards our future. You know, even for us, right, leading the church, and even for those of you in the marketplace, doing business, really, this situation, right, cannot be predicted. Not a single prophet in the whole wide world can predict what will happen to us in the future. And that's why it is important for us to continue to trust in God rather than trust in men. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. While we are facing a huge uncertainty concerning our future, and all the problems that is coming our way, what do we need to do? Ah, I want to share with you today, John chapter 14, verse 15 to 16 and 18. Okay, right? And I want to begin by reading to you this verse. It says here, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you 
and to be with you forever. And who is this advocate? The Holy Spirit called the Spirit of Truth. And he said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, what happened is that when Jesus was giving this verse to the disciples, the disciples, like us today, were facing a huge uncertainties and anxiety pertaining their future. Because Jesus was about to leave them. Jesus was about to go to heaven. And for the very first time, right, they are not able to depend on Jesus standing right next to them to help them solve their problems. The last three and a half years, their faith, right, has been relatively easy because whatever they need, they just come to Jesus and Jesus will immediately heal them, bless them, and give them a miracle. Whenever they are fearful, they are never afraid. Because why? They see Jesus right in front of them in their boat and Jesus perform a miracle to calm the storm and give them peace. So all this while, their faith in God has been relatively very easy. I mean, how many of you agree? If Jesus were to be standing next to you every day, you won't have to fear your exams. Who can say amen? <laughs> you know that your exams will surely pao tiak one. Okay, right? Right? How many of you know that if you have Jesus here standing next to you, you will not be afraid pertaining to your future because you know that your future is pretty secured with Jesus. However, Jesus told the disciples, I will not be with you forever. I need to leave you guys. I need to go to heaven. But when I go to heaven, I will give you the Holy Spirit and He will be with you forever. The problem is this. We cannot see the Holy Spirit. <laughs> We cannot touch the Holy Spirit. We cannot feel the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is, even though Jesus says the same as Him, in actual fact, He is not totally the same. He is invisible. I cannot touch Him. I cannot feel Him. I cannot be sure that He is next to me or not. So therefore, the disciples like us today were facing a lot of anxiety and uncertainties and fear. How are they going to continue without Jesus? What will happen to them if Jesus is no longer walking next to them? So Jesus told them that while they are still in this world, He said, you will experience tribulations. You cannot avoid them. Now, look at what He says in John 16 verse 33. Jesus told them. So He said this, guys, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to be with you, to guide you and to help you. But the problem is you cannot feel Him. <laughs> you cannot touch Him. You cannot... You cannot uh, you cannot see him. He is very invisible, right? He's like a wind. And then he said, John 16 verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. How many of you can say amen? amen? So Jesus told them, yes, as long as you are in this world, you will encounter problems. As long as you are living in this world, problems cannot be avoided. You see, that's the problem for many of us. We think that when we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit helps us to avoid our problems. Remember, His name is called the Helper, not the Avoider. If the Holy Spirit is called the Avoider, then He will help you to avoid all problems. Then He will help you to eliminate all problems. But the problem is, He is called the Helper. Why is He called the Helper? Precisely is to help you go through problems. That's why there are many problems that God wants you to go through instead of disappear. Similarly, like this pandemic, right? We wish that somebody can stand, you know, in the world scene and declare COVID be gone and immediately COVID the next day is gone. But the problem is this, things don't happen that way. Who can say amen? We have to go through this problem together. We have to ride through this storm. And that's why this season, Jesus is trying to encourage us, take heart. While you guys are going through your problem, the Holy Spirit will help you. And not only that, I have given you a guarantee. I have already overcome the world. How many of you can say amen? That means Jesus gave them this promise. Number one, He will help you to the very end. Right? Number two, at the end of the day, you and I will surely be the winner. 
That means you and I will surely come out victorious. So while you're going through this problem, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will help you. And then at the end of it, God promised us that you and I will eventually become victorious. How many of you can say amen? But the problem is this. Until we experience that victory that has been promised to us, currently, the struggle is very real. We have yet to experience that victory. Who can say amen? That's why I put up here, right, between the already and the not yet. You see, God has already given us the victory. But today, where we are living, we have not yet experienced the victory. You see, God always promised you, NBC, you are going to become the head and not the tail. This church is going to become a blessing to the nation. That is the promise. And that is the already, that God has already spoken the word to every one of us who can say amen. But until then, the not yet, we still have not experienced it yet. You see, this is the problem that we Christians always struggle in. Between the promise and the reality. Between the future and the now. This is our battlefield of faith. This is where we are struggling in our faith and in our belief and in our trust in God. You see, it's just like when God speaks to you young people. You know what, young people, you are going to become successful. It is a promise. But you have yet to experience it. You have yet to enjoy it. You have yet to experience that blessing. So therefore, between the not yet and the already, ah, this is the battlefield of our faith. And this is where many Christians halfway give up on God. This is where many Christians, they fail to trust God. They give up on believing in God. They give up in trusting Jesus. Because it seems that the promise is very far. <laughs> they cannot see the promise coming to pass. Ah, you see, this is the battlefield of our faith. And that's why God has to send us the Holy Spirit to help us. Holy Spirit wants to help you. Now, I want you to say it, you know, to yourself, Holy Spirit will help me. Thank you very much. Hallelujah, right? So, Holy Spirit has been sent by God to help you. Now, how does the Holy Spirit help you in our battlefield of faith to bring us from the not yet to the already? Ah, how does the Holy Spirit help us? I'm glad you asked. Today, I have only two points. But I hope these two points will really minister and bless you greatly so that you and I will end up victorious at the end of the pandemic. How many of you can say Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a big round of applause this morning. Hallelujah, right? Number one, the Holy Spirit, right, empowers us with courage to face our danger. Notice, the Holy Spirit empowers us with courage to face our danger, not to run away from danger, not to avoid danger. You see, the Holy Spirit empowers us with courage to face our danger and not avoid or run away from danger. Now, I'll give you an example. When the early church, when the disciples started the church in the book of Acts, immediately the early church was faced with danger, with threats, and with a lot of opposition. Now, you know that the oppositions against them was so great that one by one were taken to jail, one by one were captured, and apparently, they managed to capture Peter and John and after threatening them and told them not to ever preach the gospel ever again, they released them. So upon release, Peter and John went back to the church. Now, look at what happened in Acts chapter 4, verse 29 to verse 31. Okay, right? When the early church was facing a danger, what happened? Look at Acts 4. He says this, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now look at this. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to spoke the word of God boldly. Okay? What happened? Over here, Peter and John, after being released from prison, went back to the church. And the church, right, 
was facing a huge threat, huge danger, opposition, for them not to ever preach the gospel again in the city. So they begin to pray. Do you notice? When you are faced with a danger, what must you do? Go to the Holy Spirit to pray. Don't run away from God. Who can say amen? When you are facing a problem, go to the Holy Spirit and pray. Don't run away from God. Don't blame God. Don't get angry with God when your girlfriend don't like you anymore. Amen, right? Go to God and pray and seek His direction. So they came and they prayed. Now notice, when they were facing a huge opposition, they went to God and they prayed. And as they prayed, the Bible says what? The Holy Spirit came and filled them. And the entire place was shaken. And after that, they went away boldly to continue to preach the gospel. Now, do you notice or not? Okay, so take a look at this. Yeah? So they were a bit afraid. So they come to Jesus and they pray. They come to the Holy Spirit, they pray. And the Holy Spirit filled them. And then they become bold to preach the gospel. Now, what happened when the Holy Spirit came upon them and caused them to become bold? You see, many of us Christians have this idea that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they suddenly, right, it's like electricity came upon them because the whole place was shaken. Ma. So they were like, you know, it's like suddenly the Holy Spirit came upon them and it's like Dragon Ball, you know, from Son Goku, you become a Super Saiyan. Amen, right? Right. Suddenly, right, your whole entire hair from black becomes golden. You know, as you were praying, right, suddenly, right, what happened is that the Holy Spirit came and filled you and changed you from Clark Kent to become Superman. Suddenly, right, Iron Man started to come into your body, pam, 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 and you become an Iron Man. And then, because of that transformation, you become bold to preach the gospel. You see, many of us have this idea that when you are afraid, that when you are facing danger, you pray to the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit must somehow give you this electricity power and change you to become Superman. Or in this case, you think that they were afraid and suddenly the spirit of boldness came upon them and take over them and suddenly all their fear has been overpowered with the spirit of boldness. Does it happen that way? Did it happen that way? Now, church, I want to ask you, 95% of the time when you are facing a crisis and when God helps you, how many of you know 95% of the time the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way? <laughs> because I've gone through many crises in life. I have yet to be transformed to become Superman. I have yet to be changed to become like Super Saiyan. I am still the same, weak, Aris Zulkarnain. Hallelujah, right? But what happened? What happened to these people that caused them to become bold? What caused the transformation inside them by the power of the Holy Spirit? How does the Holy Spirit work? Ah, you see, church, they are not being filled with spirit of boldness. The Bible simply says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened when you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Ah, I'm glad you asked. Because in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, gives us this clue. Something happened to you when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans 5, 5. What did he say? He says what? Just now, uh, our brother over here was speaking about hope, right? He says here, hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Ah. One more time. What happened when the Holy Spirit came upon you? The Bible says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Listen, when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, they were not filled with spirit of boldness. Instead, they were filled and they begin to experience the immense anointing power of God's love upon them. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they didn't experience a supernatural power that transformed them to become supermen. But instead, they were all filled with God's love. What's the use of God's love when I'm facing failure in front of me? What's the use of God's love when I'm facing a problem in front of me? Ah, that's where you are wrong. 
You see, church, when the Holy Spirit fills us, God's love is poured out into our hearts. And we become filled with the love of God inside us. And something about God's love that helps us overcome fear. Not by transforming us to become supermen. Not by giving us the power like Super Sanyan to overcome our problem. But instead, God's love will do this to us and help us overcome problem. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Do you see that when God's love comes upon you, the love of God will drive out every fear? Pastor, I still don't understand. I still don't get you. Uh, I give you an illustration, right? I give you an illustration. You know, how many of you, right, still remember the first day when you go to school? You know, I still remember when I was, I mean, in Singapore, when you are two years old, three years old, you're already sent to nursery already. But back then, when I, was in, when I was in Indonesia, I still remember I only go to school when I'm ready to go to kindergarten. And kindergarten means you are about five years old. Okay, right? So roughly you can remember at that age what happens to you and your emotions. Now, for the first five years of my life, I've been at home, I've been with my parents, and my parents have been with me, rarely separated from my parents. Now, what happened is that at five years old, my mother told me, it's time for you to go to school. Wow, immediately fear came upon me. <laughs> what happened? Because it is going to be the first time where I have to be separated from my, from my parents and I need to step into a new environment. How many of you remember the fear that you have to go through the first time you go to school? Oh, nobody. Okay, hallelujah. Amen, right? Maybe you guys have been sent to school by your parents at uh, one year old. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> So you don't remember, right? Uh, but usually, right, when you go to kindergarten on the first day of school, first day of school, do you notice or not, right? So all the cute boys and the cute girls are being brought to school by their parents. Uh, and you notice or not, right? The father, right, or the mother, right, will hold the cute boy and the cute girls by their hand. Huh? Okay, right? Now, when they were going to school holding hands, now, the cute boy holding on to the father's hands are experiencing a lot of fear. I'm experiencing a lot of uncertainty. Will people bully me? What will happen to me if I'm separated from my parents? What is the school going to be like? Is the teacher going to be very fierce towards me or not? So this boy over here is going through a lot of fear, right? Now, as they are walking to school, holding hands with the parents, he knows that the parents love him. But still, the parents is bringing him to school. <laughs> so what happened is that when they reach right, the school gate, right, do you notice, right, what happened, the parents will stop, and then the parents, right, will go down to the boy's height, and then the parents will, what, hug him, and then the parents will kiss this boy, right, and the girl's cheek, 20 times, amen, right, and then the parents will tell the little boy, daddy is so proud of you, Daddy loves you. Mommy loves you. You are a smart boy. And a kiss again. Kiss, kiss, kiss it 20 times. Now, guys, I want to ask you this question. When the boy at that moment of time was being hugged by the father, being hugged, hugged by the mother, kissed 20 times by the parents, I tell you, that boy experienced the love. When they were holding hands, he knows that the parents love him, but he, has not, he did not experience that love right there and then, that moment. But that day, when he went to the school gate, and when the father hugged him and kissed him 20 times, and the mother hugged him and kissed him 20 times, and tell him, good boy. Okay, right? That boy experienced the love of the parents, the love of the father. And that love, Give him enough courage to go to school. And what happened is that after the father hugged him, kissed him 20 times, how many of you know the father will not, are you supporting or you're crying? Okay, let's go back home. Hallelujah, amen, right? <laughs> do you think the father will do that? Do you think the mom will do that? Are you, you're supporting, you've been crying since, since, since breakfast. I think you don't want to go to school, is it? 
You don't want to go to school, never mind. Lah. Daddy loves you. No need to go to school. Lah. Become a dumb dumb oh, the whole day, uh, the whole of your life. Lah. Do you think the parents will do that? No. After the parents kiss him, after the parents hug him, and that boy felt that love from the parents, felt the assurance from the parents, felt the love of God from the, uh, from, uh, the love of the parents, what happened? The parents will put him down and told the child, now, go to school. I, this is exactly how the Holy Spirit helps us. You see, He is leading us into the danger. We are going through the danger together. Who can say amen? amen? But occasionally, we become very afraid. Occasionally, when the news come, wow, 60 new cases every day. Wow, you know, we're going to stop meeting in groups of two. We cannot go out. What will happen to my business? What will happen to my ministry? What will happen to my life? What will happen to my purpose? What will happen when, Lord, when, when can I go travel overseas ever again? Like for me, you know, I'm feeling fearful about my parents back in Indonesia. I have, I have not met my parents for the last one and a half years. Every day I'm praying, God, do not let them kind of COVID. Even though my father got one last year, uh, two, uh, what, last year, yes, hallelujah, right? And he managed to get over it. We all face danger. But occasionally when we are fearful and we say, Lord, I cannot already. That's, what I have. that's when God comes upon you. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the Holy Spirit will hug you. The Holy Spirit will kiss you 20 times. And the Holy Spirit will tell you, Pastor Stephen, you can do it. NBC, you can do it. I'm with you. I, Riz, don't worry. You serve me, I will take care of your family. You can do it. Guess what? The Holy Spirit after that didn't say, okay lah, since you cry so much, I stop the pandemic for you lah. I make this pandemic disappear. No. He will put you down again and he will say, now, continue. <laughs> now, continue your journey. You will be all right. And somehow, with that love of God given to you, felt by you that moment, give you enough courage to continue, keep on keeping on, and not give up until you reach the other side. How many of you can say amen? Come on, give Jesus a big round of applause. Hallelujah, right? The love of God drives out fear. God's love drives out the fear of the consequences that will happen to us. So, you have no choice but to face the danger. Now, you know that if you continue, there is a risk that you may lose everything. There is a risk that you may experience a setback. But now, those consequences don't matter anymore. Because you say to yourself right now, I don't care. I'm just going to keep on having faith, having hope, and continue to move forward because I know God is in control. And no matter what happens, even though it is failure, God will always turn it around for my good and eventually, I will always come out victorious. And even if I'm not victorious in this lifetime, immediately after I close my eyes and die, the next moment I end up in victory. Amen. How many of you can say amen? amen? And that's the kind of faith and trust that we have in God to the point that we become fearless. And we continue to keep on keeping on until we reach the other side. That's how the Holy Spirit empowers you Give you courage to face your danger and not run away from danger. How many of you can say amen? amen. Let's give Jesus one more round of applause. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> Number two, how does the Holy Spirit help us? Number two, only two points. Okay? He will remind us of His Word. Ah. How does the Holy Spirit help us in this battlefield of faith between the already and the not yet? Number one, he, encourage, he empowers us with courage so that we can face our danger and not give up. Number two, He will remind us of His Word. Look at John 14, 16. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I say to you. Now church, very often the way the Holy Spirit reminds us of God's Word is so unpredictable and different from the way we think it should be. 
You see, we think that the Holy Spirit, every time when we face a problem, right, the Holy Spirit will remind us of a word. And that word will always, right, be that word that help us overcome our problem. Even though it is true. But the way the Holy Spirit does it is often very different from the way we think He should be. Let me give you an example, another example. I want to give you this illustration of David. David was running away from Saul. Now, Saul was threatening to kill David. So David was running away from Saul and he ran to this city called Nob, right? Not Nob, eh? Nob, hallelujah, right? N-O-B. Now, while running away from Saul and reached the place of Nob, he reached, right, the uh, temple of God over there and met up with the high priest Ahimelech. Now, what happened? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 8 to 9. And David said to Ahimelech, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. So the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one there. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Now church, David was running away from Saul. And in a haste, he didn't bring food, he didn't bring weapon in order to protect himself. So he went to the house of God and he met Ahimelech. And he asked Ahimelech, give me a weapon, give me a spear, give me a sword so that I can defend myself. Now church, David wanted to defend himself. But instead, what he got was not a weapon, instead a relic. A relic, a relic to remind himself. You see, Goliath's sword was lying there, right? Wrapped up in an ephod. The fact of the matter is this. Goliath's sword was too big for David. Goliath's sword was too heavy for David to use in a battlefield. In fact, it is of no use for David to take Goliath's sword along with him to the battlefield. But instead... The Bible says, David said to Ahimelech, there is none like it. Give it to me. He took it. Why? Why did David took it even though he knows it was too heavy and too big for him to use? Because that sword reminded him of how the Lord gave him victory while the odds were against him while facing Goliath. That sword reminded David that salvation doesn't come from the north, from the east, from the west, or from the south. Salvation always comes from the Lord. How many of you can say amen? amen? Salvation doesn't come by my own strength, by sword or by spear, but by the Lord. And that's why that sword reminded him of how God gave him victory when he had no weapons. And in fact, that incident only happened four chapters before, 1 Samuel 21. Look at 1 Samuel 17. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, but the battle is the Lord, and He will give you into our hands. What do we need? What, does, what did David need? David needed sword and spear. But when he saw Goliath, he was reminded of how just four chapters before, he himself spoke the word, the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. The Lord delivers by His mighty hand. Amen. You see, church, it is less functional than David wanted, Goliath's sword. But it does more than David expected. And always, it reminded him that the battle belongs to the Lord and God is our victory. NBC, all of us here, I want you to know, God's word is always reminding us today. He has the ultimate say and He will give you the victory. How many of you can say amen? Then if you continue to hang on in faith and hope in God, and don't give up halfway, even with your life. 
God will always give us the victory. And though it's the sword in the Bible, it's often known as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, say amen, right? You see, very often, we look down on God's Word as being impractical and useless to face our crisis and trouble. But the Word of God always serves us as reminders to not give up and to always look to God for your deliverance. Because while men always look for how to get out of the situation, God is always reminding us that it is not how you get out of your problem, it is who will get you out of your problem. And who is that person? It's always Jesus. And I want to end by saying this. Do you know, even in a recent study by, in England by the NHS, the NHS Health Research on Developing Mental Health and Self-Care, and they did this study called Targeting the Use of Reminders and Notifications for Uptake by Population, a systematic review and evidence synthesis by the NHS. And they found this. They found this. Okay, right? He said in the report, it has been suggested that simple reminders may be effective because they act as cues to counteract prospective memory failures. Numerous studies suggest that as many as 80 to 90% of patients have a positive attitude to receiving a reminder that jogs the memory. What happened? A reminder acts as cues to counteract memory failures. Whenever we face a crisis, we often forget that God is the source of our needs. We often forget that God is our deliverer. We often forget that God is our healer. But the Word of God serves as reminders that all is not lost yet. Continue to hope in God. Continue to believe in Jesus because help will always come at the end of the day at the right time. Amen. You see, church, why do we get fearful and anxious about our future? Because we always forget that our Jehovah Jireh can still provide us in good times, but especially in bad times. Who can say amen? We forgot that God is our healer. God is our present help in times of need. He is your supplication and your provider. One word of reminder from Him will jolt our spirit and our faith back again to life and to cause us not to give up and to keep on going and to keep on keeping on until we reach to the other side and experience the victory that God has promised to us. How many of you can say amen? You know what, church? I want to end by saying this. Remember Jesus? You know, Jesus on the cross when he was crucified, right? The Bible says that he was so much in pain and then he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what, church? The Bible says that Jesus could have right there and then called upon legions of angels to come and rescue him and he right there and then could have come down from the cross and not have to suffer any longer in the hands of the Romans. But he chose to stay on the cross because he knows that he needed to complete his mission on this earth to become your savior, to die for your sins so that your sin and my sins can be forgiven and you and I can experience healing and eternal life. Who can say amen? So he decided to stay. He decided to bear the pain. How did he bear the pain? The Bible says he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama shabatani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many people think, ah, yeah, you see, the pain is so bad for Jesus that finally he cursed God. That finally he showed his disappointment with God. That finally he, he, he can say, God, why are you like that? You know, it's just like for all of us young people, right? Whenever we don't get what we want, why are you like that? Huh? Hallelujah, right? You know, right? God, why are you like that? Huh? Right? Why are you always like that one? Uh, this is exactly. So many people are saying, finally, Jesus was so much in pain that he finally, uh, like us, finally cursed God, finally showed his disappointment against God and say, God, why are you like that? Is it true? No. Do you know why he said, Eli, Eli, lama shabatani? Because he was quoting the scripture. He was reminding himself of the scripture. Do you know this word, Eli, Eli, lama shabatani? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
is actually a verse that he quoted in Psalms 22. And if you go back and read Psalms 22, the entire chapter is about the messianic prophecy that will happen to Jesus on the cross. The first verse immediately say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it tells him about his future. It tells him about how God will rescue him. And it tells him about how if he continues to trust in God, finally, people will get saved and many will come to worship God. And he, right, needed to complete this task and this mission for God. And because he was so much in pain, he could have come down. But instead, he chose to use scripture to remind himself of the mission and not to forget the mission. And that's why he was able to last the distance and died for us to become our Savior. And if Jesus has lasted the distance to become our Savior, surely this pandemic, he will save all of us to the very end and bring us into victory. And everybody say, Amen. let's give Jesus a big round of applause. Hallelujah, right? Depend on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you, empower you, give you courage to face your danger. Number two, the Holy Spirit reminds you of, your, of the scripture to help you that He will always be with you and He will never leave you nor forsake you. I pray all of us, not just NBC, all of us together, the Christian community will band together in unity and to pray for one another and to encourage one another and we will reach the other side and we will come out victorious. Amen. And everybody say, Amen. let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. You know what, friends? Today, even as I end, I want to pray for you. And especially for some of you who are actually finding it difficult going through this pandemic. You're going through so much pain. You're going through so much doubt. You're going through so much opposition. And somehow you are saying to yourself, Lord, you know what? I, I can't take it any longer. It has been so difficult. Lord, please help me. You know what, friends? You are in the right place at the right time because the Holy Spirit is here to fill you, to give you God's love. And God's love will tell you He will never leave you nor forsake you. And Spirit will speak to you, remind you of the Scripture, of the Word of God pertaining your situation. I pray that this will happen in this next one week as you go back home and as you depend more on the Holy Spirit. NBC, while I schools and heads of bow, how many of you are in that kind of situation? If that is you, I want you to lift up your hands. No one is looking around. You can put it down immediately and I'll pray for you. One, two, three. Lift up your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you watching us online, those of you watching us, in, watching us here, that's right. Hallelujah. Let's just begin to pray right now. Father, we want to pray for those hands that have been lifted up. For those hearts, Lord, who are struggling inside. No one is looking, no one is seeing. No one knows and no one understands. But Jesus, you know, you are looking down from heaven. And Lord, you love us. Today, Jesus, pour out your love upon us. Pour out your love to everyone watching here and all of us here on site. And Lord, as your love is being poured out, you will give us the courage. You will give us, Lord, the faith to continue keeping on and not give up in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that as we continue to put our faith in you and as the Holy Spirit reminds us of your word, we will come out victorious. And I pray, God, that there will be a turnaround in the situation. And I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit will empower us, anoint us like never before. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of you until Jesus Christ comes back the second time again. He will save you, He will anoint you, he will empower you and He will bless you. And everybody say, Amen. Let's give Jesus a big round of applause. Hallelujah. Amen. And since we are still in, this middle, in the middle of this pandemic, as a church, we'd like to initiate what we call the Care Fund program to be a blessing to the community. This care fund will be used to help all foreigners who are residing in Singapore 
and this country with various type of long-term passes who might have been greatly affected by the current pandemic situation. So if you like to apply for this care fund, all the details is available at our website link shown below. We will provide groceries vouchers, school essentials vouchers, transport vouchers, school fees, etc. for those who are in need and affected by this pandemic. And if you like to donate for this cause, every dollar that you donate will be matched dollar to dollar by the government and thought board up to $100,000. So help us to help others who are in it. You can do so by donating for this course. All the details for you to apply or to donate can be found on our website www.nbcsingapore.org slash carefund. We are blessed to be a blessing to many.